boom. Damn, they can see us. We live. Are we, we on are. live? We are. So, uh, oh, look at the nice six-person overlay, Gregory. That is impressive. But what do you think about our new graphics here? I think they're pretty impressive. Uh, do I need to go to YouTube to see this? Yes, you can't see it on Zoom. Okay. Yeah, so you need to uh, you definitely make sure you mute it. Mute, mute your YouTube stream if you're here. What's going on, folks? Y'all are listening to us. We're about to get started. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to pick the season like we always have. We're going to do it live, which we've never done. Um, Greg Barnes makes his triumphant return to On The Beat, so um, I'm going to have to give him a hard time, but he's got me um, in the crosshairs, as we can see. But anyway, we ready to go, Gregory? We are. I'm going to record. record. You record. I'll record on my end. Let's do it. Nope. You have to record. Go ahead. <laughs> Recording in progress. There we go. We're ready. Welcome to the Inside Carolina podcast. I am your host, Tommy Ashley. You are listening to On The Beat Live, Tuesday night, 9 p.m. Got a, a rowdy bunch in the Zoom call here and a rowdy bunch on the live chat on our YouTube channel at Inside Carolina. Make sure you subscribe there. You get these alerts when we go live or whenever there's a new uh, item of viewing pleasure put up there. Also sponsored by Johnny T-shirt, Johnny T-shirt.com. They take care of us. They take mm. care of you. They love Ooh. Jason. Jason is just unbelievably in his Ricky Bobby mode. Uh, I'm going to get it started, but first I'm going to go to Greg Barnes because uh, we're going to get off on the wrong foot. And it was funny off air. So I'll let him explain his, um, his decor here since everybody seems to think that, uh, well, I want to thank Buck for creating this phenomenon, but go ahead, Greg. Well, look, the, the, the story of the day on, on Monday, if you will, was Mac Brown had told us that Monday was going to be the day that we found out who the, the backup quarterback was going to be. And I think anybody who has listened to this program and followed IC for the last, I don't know how long we've been doing these, Tommy, uh, 12, wow. 13 years, maybe, Yeah, I mean, maybe longer than that. Um, Tommy's always – at an inkling for that backup quarterback. So the fact that Mac Brown uh, really did us all a disservice and, and really um, I think he hurt Tommy not naming a backup quarterback uh, and saying that Drake May and Jacoby Criswell were, were even. Um, I thought we'd have a little bit of a tribute for, for Tommy tonight since we're celebrating the start of the season. And so uh, I was told all fair that you can't really see this list, but this is, this is a list of Tommy's favorite UNC quarterbacks over the years. Number one, of course, everybody knows this one, C.J. Stevens. Uh, John Bunting really hyped him up before the 2002 season. Of course, Darren Durant was the starter that year. Went on to have a pretty good North Carolina uh, quarterback career. Number two, Mike Paulus, uh, big-time recruit. He was offered uh, by Pete Carroll uh, at USC at the time at midfield. It was a big deal. John Bunning got him in uh, over Russell Wilson. And, of course, T.J. Yates was a, a sophomore that year, and that was just a, a big opportunity for, for Tommy to pull for Paulus because he, he was a big-name recruit. Number three, Mitch Trubisky, which I think we all can appreciate. However, you no, know, this was 2015. Uh, this was not 2016 <laughs> when Mitch actually started. This was the Marquise Williams year. But Mitch was a very good backup, and if you remember, I believe it was Delaware that Mitch came in and, and it looked lights out in that second half. I mean, he set all kinds of rating records. Uh, number four, Mike Thomas, 1994. I think Tommy was in school at that point in time. Uh, Stanisek was the starter at that time. And then just to have a little bit of fun, I, I threw Deems May, who was a friend of the program, in at number five, uh, 1989. And I think a little bit of a history lesson, and, and Buck may be able to expand on this some. Um, uh, Deems was actually – the top rated recruit in the state of North Carolina coming out uh, his senior year out of Lexington and came in as a highly rated quarterback and was actually a parade all American, if I remember correctly. Um, and Deems, of course, went on and played, switched to, to tight end and went on and played, I think, eight years in the NFL uh, at tight end. So a great career. Deems, of course, is, is very vocal and, and present around the North Carolina program these days. But uh, once upon a time, 
I mean, what is that now? Gosh, 32, 33 years ago, he was actually the, the North Carolina starting quarterback as a freshman, uh, lost the job and in 1989. He was still playing quarterback, had not quite made the, the switch to tight end. So a little bit of a homage paid to, to Deems May here. That makes him the best, uh, the best quarterback to ever play tight end at North Carolina, doesn't it? Absolutely. I think, I think we should talk more about that, Jason. Let's not, since it's at my expense. <laughs> you know, I, I will say this. I, I, I got to dig out a picture that J.B. Sissel and I, uh, the late, great J.B., took with C.J. Stevens back in the day because we were told that he was going to win the Heisman at Carolina. That's and right. we were told that he was as good as anybody that ever played the position. So He came from Florida. I mean, he had to been. <laughs> we made sure. Who was, the, who was the long descending voice in all that conversation back then? Do you remember that? Some probably guy, you. Probably me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Some guy named Buck Sanders. Yes. Uh, it did not quite work out. Uh, for I wonder where he is now. He, he probably, you know, those Florida quarterbacks go on The Bachelor and now they host game shows and – do football games and stuff. So maybe he's around, but try let's out get... for tight end for the Jag Jaguars. <laughs> he plays, yeah. He plays for that team that played IMG the other day. This goes know. to show how hard it can be to be a uh, quarterback who plays tight end. Good on you, Deems. Huh? A little yeah. bit better making that transition than Tim Tebow. So yeah, I mentioned, <laughs> I mentioned off the air that uh, in 89, Deems quarterback North Carolina to was only win that season. Everybody knows that. Mac went one on 11, uh, back to back one and 10 back to back years. Deems was responsible for the only win and playing quarterback, um, that year. So, wow. Got his Just, name in the record books there. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. He got the, the, that would have been the first win for Mac Brown at North Carolina. Hmm, that is, that's a trivia, trivia pursuit. We'll play that one day. Uh, let's get this thing rolling. This is on the beat. Like I said, sponsored by Johnny T-Shirt and JohnnyT-Shirt.com. Fun show tonight. We're going to do the predictions. With the predictions means I've got to get everybody in here that was on here last year. Awesome. Save for Gregory Hall. Yeah, Gregory Hall, the new guy. Um, Gregory went from the guy that got picked on to the guy that has a fan club in a matter of six episodes. So that's a pretty impressive rise for the young man. Of course, Buck Sanders always bringing the reasonableness to it. Jason Staples and Greg Barnes uh, bring in what they bring. I think they're defending champions in this thing. And, of course, Taylor Vipolis. Taylor is uh, pretty epic in these as well. Throws up tons of content for Inside Carolina. Getting it started this week um, with the podcast yesterday with Mike and EJ and Taylor. Good listen, actually listen to that. Uh, walking up down the hills in this neighborhood. So here we are. Here are going to be the rules. Hold on. Go ahead. Here we go. I was just going to say. Already started. You can cut me off anytime. I don't want to make your fan club mad. You pauses in between your, your speaking. Come on. Got that, it. That Johnson County Southern draw. Um, I wrote in the teaser that Greg was the ultimate victor, even though both Jason and Greg went 8-3. and three. That Well, voted 8-3 and three last year because Greg got two losses correct and Jason only got one. So it's not technically. Tiebreaker goes to G Biggie down here in my bottom right and Just buck got record. both losses correct is that is that right buck that he is did. correct and i i throw the challenge fan on the challenge flag on the uh who's the victor here i mean we but, can play uh, we can put i was only wrong on one game by virtue of him calling it a challenge fan i think that challenge is immediately overruled <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know uh let, let's take this five uh box uh, zoom down to uh four uh, <laughs> box down to five we uh what's funny is there's only one person that got called out by a defensive coordinator last year and that's greg barnes for his boston college prediction so we'll see who ca catches that this year i'm sure it's coming from somebody <laughs> uh quick setup on the rules gregory's gonna throw it up on the screen here shortly but we're going to bypass georgia state even though i think they're probably a pretty good team and wofford so we're going to narrow this down to the to the games that we think are questionable here. We probably could throw Duke in that as well, but we'll leave Duke for the pick em. So no Georgia State. We're going to raise your hand if you agree that's a win for Carolina. Everybody on the same page. Wofford, everybody's on the same page. So let's get straight into it. You know, there is a reason you play the game. 
but that's a win. Yeah. If, 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 if we are discussing those games on the day after pod, uh, I can assure you that we've had major issues um, in Chapel Hill leading up to that one and in the aftermath. So let's go to Virginia Tech, Friday night, 6 o'clock. Buck, since you are El Presidente, I'll let you start on this one. I know that you and Greg Barnes have a bottle of bourbon on this game. Um, so I'm going to give you an opportunity to state your case first, and then I'll let Greg follow it as well, and then the rest of us will chime in. Hmm. When, when did a bottle of bourbon get in, uh, get into the side bet on this? I, I think that North Carolina is going to beat Virginia tech, but I do not see it as a slam dunk that, uh, Greg Barnes uncharacteristically has pegged this game since last year. Um, he's consistently said that North Carolina is going to beat Virginia tech and he's going to, we're going to beat them stupid, but, uh, now, I think it'll be a closer game than that, but I think North Carolina wins. Greg Barnes, G Biggie. In fact, you need to have a Twitter account, but that's another story because um, we have surpassed that uh, requirement by far. But tell me about Virginia Tech here Friday night. I do have a Twitter account, and it's at Inside Carolina. Oh, oh I thought he was about to drop it just like that. Oh, no. <laughs> what a return that would have been. I've logged a lot of hours on uh, – I see his Twitter account over the years. So that's, that's, that's home. Um, yeah. You know, uh, I think some people have kind of, I don't want to say misconstrued, but maybe I, I've, I've viewed my comments about Virginia tech uh, from the wrong perspective. Um, I, I think North Carolina is going to be good as you'll see in this uh, episode tonight. I'm not using this game as kind of a springboard to say North Carolina is going to be elite because uh, that's, I'm not ready to go there. I just think Virginia Tech um, is living off the past. And I know they got a lot of guys back, and I understand the situation last year. Um, I mean, listen to Whit Babcock talk about how upwards of 75% of their roster got COVID last year, how eight of the 10 assistant coaches got it. I mean, you know, that, that's severe, and, and that really affects you. Uh, in the game against Carolina last year, they had 15 guys out due to COVID, including – uh, five defensive backs that were in the two deep. That's significant. However, the fact that they have lost, have, have, have had losing seasons to the last three years, um, Fuente has not recruited well. I mean, that was really the telltale sign for, for Larry Fedora. Was went through, once recruiting kind of went sideways, there was no getting it back. Um, and I, I just have a feeling Fuente is following that same footprint um, and so because of that, I, I think Virginia Tech is, is not one of the more difficult games for UNC, other than it's, it's the first game that's on the road. You have the atmosphere element. But team-wise, I don't think Virginia Tech is going to be near as good as some of these other teams. And so I've got North Carolina winning this one handily, uh, 41-27. Vip, I'll let so, you go because I know so what – Greg has tripled down on his double digits now. Two touchdowns, yeah. I like it. We need to hash out the bourbon deal after the show is over. Um, folks sure. are already asking which bourbon, but that was a bet for 100%. It anyway. was. But we, we did decide it wasn't going to be some swanky bottle of bourbon. It was going to be a – Buck, did you have a score prediction? Uh, I, I think not... the Tar Heels will win by about the, the spread, but uh, I don't think it's double digits. But, you know, we just call the wins and nails, uh, W's and nails, I, I think. Know, it's just, yeah. vicious. just for, just for betting purposes, yeah. Yeah. What is the spread on that one? I actually haven't seen five and a half. Five and a half. Go ahead, Vip. You're up. Yeah, I think when I look at this Virginia Tech team and compare them to North Carolina, I get that week one, a lot of weird things can kind of happen where I think if this game was in the middle of the season, there would be no question for me that I would pick Carolina to win uh, pretty handily. I'm closer to um, Greg's side of thinking than – somebody like Buck who thinks that this game could be close and kind of stay within that number. But even, even with it being week one and Virginia tech, having the the home fans behind them, I think that North Carolina is still going to beat them pretty convincingly and kind of go out and make a statement. They've been hearing all year about people hyping them up. And the whole conversation for this North Carolina team is that they want to prove to people that the hype is real, that there's some substance behind all the talk of people and, 
you get Sam Howell's Heisman campaign started with, I think, a double digit win in Blacksburg. And when I look at when I look at this Virginia Tech team, I think if you have a quarterback like last year, like Hendon Hooker, I think a guy like Hendon Hooker can beat Carolina's defense week one when you're still trying to figure things out. From the, from the games that I've watched, Braxton Burmeister, I, I don't see a quarterback that, that can beat North Carolina. Um, so I would say North Carolina wins by, by double digits. That's a great point there, Vip. I will say if they played Hendon Hooker the entire game last year in Chapel Hill, they win that game. Hendon Hooker but, didn't win the job at Tennessee. Well, that's Tennessee, but he's better than Burmeister, and, and he should have played the entire game in Chapel Hill. Jason Staples – you talk about the environment at Virginia Tech not being what everybody says it is. You've certainly it's been there not. firsthand. But given that it's been a two-year deal without any kind of environment, do you think it makes a difference? And what's your pick? Um, I don't think it makes that much of a difference, especially since you got a, you got a veteran quarterback who's been there, done that, and the stadium's just not that loud there. So, I mean, it's not going to be that big of an issue, I don't think, for them. Um you know, and the other thing, quite frankly, a lot of folks forget this. You don't play the stadium, <laughs> right? I mean, the, and, and what's really sort of irritating to me about a lot of this is that you look at the way ESPN in particular has covered games at Lane Stadium over the years. They've treated it like it's the opposing team against Lane Stadium and the fans, and it's like, look, yeah, it's cool that they do the whole like Metallica entrance and all that, but that's not even that loud. Like I was on the field listening to that and was like, wow, it's over already. Like I didn't really, I thought that would be a lot cooler <laughs> given what I saw on television and it just, you know, you don't notice the atmosphere as much there uh, as what you, as what you'd expect. And even if you did again, Teams play teams, not stadiums. And I just think Carolina has a significantly better team in this game than Virginia Tech. And if, you know, I'm looking at a, at a potential upset, I want to see a team that has a quarterback that makes me go, okay, yeah, that's, that's the kind of guy that, you know, if he goes off, they could really do it. And I don't see that with Burmeister. I just don't see a guy that's going to go out there and just, suddenly play like a first round pick and out duel Sam Howell. Uh, so the, the, the other thing is that, that last year, you look at what happened last year and the year before, really they were able to put Carolina's linebackers in conflict and also bully Carolina up front on the defensive line. And I think that's going to be significantly harder for teams to do this this year. I think they're going to be improved enough on the defensive line that that's going to be a, a more difficult task. And if they're not able to bully him, I just don't, I don't see them racing up and down the field against, against Carolina secondary. So I, I think this is a double digit win for Carolina. Gregory, I, I'll, you can go ahead and put me a W. I can't say anything better than everybody else has already said. So yeah, if you and I are going to be going last the whole time, then we we're we're just chilling, you know? We'll, we'll mix up a little bit, but yeah, I, I got nothing else. Well, if, Tommy's if, going to have plenty to say about a, you know, some sort of backup quarterback about what about Wake Forest area where he, somebody he's going to expect <laughs> heroics from somebody. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. I also have it as a W. I'm closer Our, to Buck than I am to maybe two touchdowns. I think it'll be. Um, I I just put my prediction in. Um, I just gave the Virginia Tech 247 sports guy my prediction, and I don't remember what I put, but it was maybe like 35-27 or something along those lines. So more of a single-digit oh. guy for this one just because of what I've said in the past about someone's going to drop a wide-open touchdown pass, and it's just – that's just going to – that's just going to – that's that's the difference between winning by two touchdowns and one is going to be that drop. So I'm sticking with that. All right, so Carolina goes 2-0 and the first two weeks of the season – um, like we said, everybody's got a W across the board for Georgia State. Virginia. Greg, last year Carolina lost to a Virginia team that a lot of people wanted to say was a bad team. I didn't think so. Um, and I don't necessarily know too much about them yet this year. Um, but they were a decent team last year. I, I don't think Carolina can overlook this one. I don't think they will for sure, especially with it being in Kenyon Stadium. No, definitely not. And uh, look, I got got a little bit of grief um, 
last year for, for picking Boston College, you know what? Uh, I, I think it's time. I think this is going to be the game that I'm going to, I'm going to circle for North Carolina. Uh, Bronco Mendenhall is adamant that this is going to be the best offensive team that he has had in Charlottesville. Uh, Brendan Armstrong finally has a, uh, a full season under his belt. They really like what he can do. The reason Virginia won that game last year is because they won the line of scrimmage on both sides. Um, and while I think uh, some of these other teams may not have the quarterback capable of beating in North Carolina, I think you beat North Carolina, especially as talented as Sam Howell is, by winning at the line of scrimmage. Uh, and I just think Virginia's got the opportunity to be able to step in and, and do that, especially with North Carolina feeling high and mighty after a 2-0 start. Uh, so this is my surprise. This is, this is uh, an early surprise, but I've got North Carolina losing this game to Virginia in Keenan Stadium. I guarantee you somebody's calling Greg out in the next press conference. <laughs> Without question. Vip. The Broncos 2-0 and against Mac, right? That Greg's is a, a – Greg's a Bronco Mendenhall sympathizer. <laughs> I like Bronco. Vipolis, what's you got? Yeah, I'm – I know Buck has said this before where it's like if a, if a trend keeps on happening, I have to see the trend go the opposite way before I pick against it. But I refuse to live in a world where I think Virginia could beat Carolina five straight years in a row. Um, 2017, 2018, you could kind of throw those games out because North Carolina just had a ton of issues at the quarterback position. And I just can't see somebody like Sam Howell going 0-3 in his career against Virginia. I think – Virginia is a lot better, like Greg mentioned, than people think. Brennan Armstrong, great quarterback. Bronco Mendenhall gets a lot out of all his players. But if Carolina starts the year off 2-0 and and they have their ACC home opener against Virginia and they have all this hype behind them, I, I just can't see them losing. And I can't in good faith pick Virginia to win that game just because <laughs> I just can't see it happening. Just can't see it happening. Lord have mercy, if it happens. Jason, what do you think? Dang it, Greg. Oh, here we go. The, if you're <laughs> if you're new to this on the beat, this kind of stuff, they piggyback on each other all the time, folks. I don't know if you saw me start to shake my head as soon as you said when you started saying <laughs> what you were saying. It's like, oh, come on. I... <sighs> wow. So for those of you who haven't listened to this before, to, to, to this side of things before, you'll you'll – uh, you'll not be as familiar with this, but everybody else, you know that when I step into a season, one of the things that I factor in is the, uh, it's just a percentage thing, right? So I might expect a team to be the better team in 11 games that, during that season. But that doesn't mean that I expect that team to win 11 games because you don't win all the games where you're the better team. You have to be the better team by a lot to win all those games because you get bad bounces here or there. Somebody gets hurt in the wrong time. Different things happen. So what I have always done is take a win shares approach where, you know, I'm, I, I get my idea of what percentages are, are around likely for each game and then basically a lot that to the season. So I've got a number in mind in terms of where I think Carolina is going to finish on the year. And when I look at the schedule, I go, man, you know, I, I think they're going to lose a couple games, most likely, you know, either two or three games based on sort of where they are talent wise versus the rest of the schedule overall. But it's really hard to pick which games are are going to be the losses because they're actually the better team in a lot of these, in a lot of these games. But if you are playing 10 games where you are the favorite in 10 games, but you're only 60% the favorite, you're expected to go six and four. Yeah. You should win every one of those games, but you're not going to, because you're only 60%. You're only 60% likely. The Virginia game is a game where I think Carolina is probably somewhere around, you know, 75% chance of, of a win. You know, if I'm, if I'm picking that in a given week, but in the preseason, I've got to pick, pick a loss or two here because ultimately there's going to be a game where there's a slip up. And this happens to be one of the two that I look at and go, this is one of the most likely slip ups in my view. 
So I'm going to pick this as a loss along with Greg and shoulder some of that, uh, some of that hater aid, I guess, from folks. I'm going to go with a loss here as well for a lot of the same reasons. When I, you know, I think Mendenhall is really, uh, is a really good coach. And I think the Carolina coaching staff is, is great as well. But I think Mendenhall is, is one of the best coaches on the, on the, uh, on the schedule. And they get a lot of talent back in the secondary that they didn't have last year. And they were, they were very vulnerable in the secondary last year, which, which suited Carolina especially well. And, and, and they still won that game. And I think they're going to be a good bit better in the secondary this year. They're not quite as good up, up front on defense, but they're going to be good enough. And they return their whole offense. So I, I think this is going to be a dogfight. If I have to pick a loss, this is one of the most likely losses on the schedule. And uh, Tommy, to, to illustrate Jason's point further there, uh, teams that are favored by a touchdown win 70% of the time in the college game. And so what that means is if North Carolina was favored by a touchdown in every single game that it plays this year, the projected win-loss record would be eight and a half wins and three and a half losses, even though they're favored in every single game. That's just kind of how the odds work. Uh, and so I know that could be confusing for some people. I think the FBI, uh, Buck may have this in front of him. I don't. But I think Carolina's favored in 10 games, and they've got them winning eight and a half. Uh, so that, that's why there's a little bit of discrepancy of just because Carolina may be favored doesn't mean that they're guaranteed to win. And it's a really hard thing because, you know, when you go in, you expect the better team to win every time. I mean, that's why you play the game and all. But the thing about it is there's an aspect of randomness to, to these things where, you know, we all see it in March Madness where the better team doesn't always win. Sometimes it's somebody catches fire and that's that. And that happens in football. The, the best teams, the reason that some teams go, you know, 11 and one or 12 and zero or whatever, those are teams that they are favored by 30 in a number of those games. And when they have their C game, they only win by 10. And, you know, that's the thing that, that, that you, that Carolina is building to that. And, you know, within the next couple of years, they're going to be in position, I think talent wise to be having those, those kinds of, of expectations because they're going to be favored by that. If I remember right, the, the teams that are favored by 14 still only win, I think 65% or 60%. I can't remember what the number is, but it's been a while, Four but. Yeah, it's is well, fourteen is up to eighty five percent. Eighty five percent, still what higher. It? But... It's it's, it's it, there's a cutoff at like between ten and fourteen where it takes a jump, but just under that, it's you're you're still really ripe for for an upset. So I do think that there's mitigating factors there. If you have a great quarterback, you're less likely to get upset. If you have you know a great defensive line, maybe you're a little bit less likely to get upset. So those numbers get fudged a little bit more toward the middle, and I think the outliers tend to win a little bit more than than their share. But anyhow, I got to pick a loss or two on this schedule, and this is one of them, and it's painful to do because I think this is a pretty good Carolina team. Would you put money on it though? Come game week, would you put money UVA plus points? I would have to see the two teams play before that. Okay, I, but would would I today? No. Okay. No, I would not. Gotcha. you. Buck Sanders. Said, uh, Sherelle's said, calling us out. He said that the analysis is smart, but give him some good old fashioned gut. <laughs> we should get, we need, we can go a seven person overlay and get Sherelle down there at the bottom. Buck Sanders speaks some common sense to these people. If, if Carolina loses to Virginia Tech and, oh, excuse me, to Virginia, uh, and Gregor, you can put me in a W column already, then they learn nothing from last year. Nothing. That's my take. But what you got? Well, you, they were talking about the FPI, and I've got the FPI in front of me, and I've got the uh, SP+. Plus. There are several games on the schedule that North Carolina is favored by nearly three touchdowns or a little bit more. Virginia is one of them. Uh, and so they're, they're favored by almost 20 points against Virginia, S&P+. Plus. And the uh, probability of a win is 79.4. So uh, if Virginia beats North Carolina at home, it will truly be an extremely random occurrence. Uh, extraordinarily random. Now, that it, did it happen last year at Virginia? Yes. Did it happen at FSU? Yes. But they're playing at home. Uh, and I do not see 
Um, I, I think this team is built a little bit different in that I do not see, regardless of what the results are on the field, uh, North Carolina ever getting the big head during this season. I just, I just think Max probably got that um, issue under control. So I'm going to pick a win. I think it'll probably be by at least two touchdowns. Uh, I think it's, I certainly get Jason's point and Greg's point that s- somewhere down the line, you just have to assume that um, somebody's going to have to take a loss, but uh, because of percentages, but if they do, I do not believe it'll be the Virginia game. You got Junior. I see you changed your name on there. I'm gonna call you Junior. Somebody told me to. I gotta respect. I gotta respect our fans. You know, unlike you. You know. Um. <laughs> oh, he's fanning the the fan hate now. <laughs> I there's going to be losses, and I will we'll get to what my loss is later. But it's not Virginia. It's just not. Especially ACC home opener. Um, I don't think Virginia matches up well. I understand Brendan Armstrong's a good quarterback, but he's just not the guy to beat to beat UNC, especially going up against uh, just Sam Howell and just the overall. Especially if they're two and zero. Now, if they're one and one, maybe. But since I've already got them two and zero, I've got them going three and zero after week three. So we got uh, two losses on the board: Barnes and Staples against Virginia. Vipolis, you start us off against Georgia Tech. I will say this. Georgia Tech, I would worry more about Georgia Tech than I would about Virginia. But go ahead, Vip. No. no uh, yeah, I'm going to disagree with that. <laughs> I think Jeff Collins is doing a great job, and I think he, he's got them going in the right direction. But North Carolina is still going to be way too much for Georgia Tech in the um, in the Georgia Dome, which is going to be a great atmosphere, I think, for a game. I've, I've been in if Carolina goes into that game 3-0 and in Atlanta, it is going to be packed with UNC fans. And the the last time Carolina played in the Georgia Dome, that 2016 game against Georgia, I think you kind of saw what could happen when you do have such a big crowd for one team in that stadium go, pulling for pulling for one team. So I think you would see something, something to that effect where I can't see too many Georgia Tech fans uh, going to that game and being that excited for their team. It, it just doesn't seem like a, a school that really gets completely behind their team. I've been to a couple of games at their stadium and kind of an underwhelming experience. So I was happy when I saw that this game was their game that was going to be played in the uh, Mercedes Benz dome. So I think this is, this is going to be a win that, um, that Carolina wins pretty, pretty convincingly like what Jeff Collins is doing, but it's, this isn't the year where I would be worried about Georgia tech. All right, let's go, Junior. Georgia Tech, you said no right out the gate on my comment, so go ahead and put you a W down. For I don't even know if this one needs an explanation. I mean, Georgia Tech, they're still building. They're just not there yet. I think they're getting better, but after what I watched, gosh, was that two years ago? I think that was two years ago, Greg, that you and I went to Atlanta. Is that correct? Yes, that was two Probably. years ago. Probably. <laughs> It's just, yeah, there's just not, especially with where UNC is now. And yeah, that's not even, I'm not even considering that going to be a loss. And if it is, then you can pull this audio up and be like, what were you thinking? But I don't think, yeah, no way. Beat you like a drum with this audio, but Georgia Tech, no chance for, for the yellow jackets. Yeah. You know, um, oddly enough, the, uh, SP plus likes Georgia Tech much better than they like Virginia in the game before they like them a touchdown better. Um, they only favor North Carolina by like a less than two touchdowns is 12.7, something like that. I think they've got a, uh, their quarterback is going to be an improved, um, uh, put an improved product on the field and their running back, um, is going to be something special. He also returns punt. So I, I think they've got some offensive weapons. Uh, I don't think, They've got the defensive weapons that are going to be able to prevent North Carolina from scoring enough points to win in this one. So if I was going to pick an upset, though, at this point of the year, uh, I'd pick Georgia Tech over Virginia by a lot. But um, I'm going to pick North Carolina to win, uh, but I think it could be less than 10 points, maybe a little over 10 points. 
Barnes. Yeah. Uh, to kind of follow up on what Taylor said, Jeff Collins has done a really good job recruiting. You know, he has the SEC background. He kind of understands that dynamic. Uh, I mean, Georgia is a hotbed, especially around Atlanta, even though that's that's fertile Georgia area uh, for, for Kirby Smart. So he, he's done what he needs to do with recruiting. Now he's got to put it together. And, yeah, Jeff Sims is good. Jameer Gibbs is a, is a great running back. Um, and I watched the game last year against Florida State to open the season thinking, okay, yeah, this is pretty solid, not knowing what Florida State was at the time. Um, but, I mean, they, they got smoked by U, UCF, got boat raced by Syracuse, by Boston College. Um, Clemson beat them 73-7. to seven. So while the recruiting is going well, Jeff Collins has got to prove that he can actually coach that he can actually make these guys better and, and make the, the whole better than just the, the parts. Um, you know, we can talk about Virginia a lot. If you want to, Bronco has a long history of taking guys that other people may be discard and building very competitive, uh, smart, hard nosed teams. Jeff hasn't proven that yet. And so until he does, uh, I'm not going to give him any kind of shot in these types of games. And I think it's going to be a great opportunity for North Carolina to play in an NFL stadium. Uh, and I think Carolina just, just has its way with the Yellow Jackets. Interesting. Staples. I'm not going to say a whole lot here because everybody else has basically covered what I think. I think Georgia Tech is is a year away, really, from being at that point of competitiveness. They're headed in the right direction. They've, they've done a really good job of identifying talent, but I don't think that this is a team that beats Carolina this year. Interesting take. So throw them up, Gregory Hall, throw up W's and W's across the board. Let, let's treat Duke like we treated Georgia State and Wofford. Does anybody Ooh. have an objection? I have no objection to this. Ooh. <laughs> I have no objection. I just, I just think – it's funny. Uh, for the record, <laughs> I, you know, I love Cutcliffe. Does you know, anyone I, I have thought, the chat object to that? I, I thought he's done uh, – I think he's done about as much as you can do at Duke. And um, for the record, I enjoy going to games over there. It is just cool to chill. It's like watching a game in your living room. Um, but anyway. I was I was going to say, Tommy, I, I love that statement. The uh, Nobody does more with less than Cutcliffe, which is just the nicest way to say – Duke sucks. just doesn't have the talent. They just don't have the talent. <laughs> and and honestly, the thing is, I think it's getting pretty close to time for Cutcliffe uh, in terms of I'm, I don't think that that program is headed in the right direction at this stage. I don't. I mean, they had it really moving in the right direction, but just in terms of talent and other things, that that program, I think they're in for another rough year. And you know, you've got to you got to wonder what what uh, what's next there. Where's the where's the Thad Lewis type? I mean, you know, the the Cutcliffe way that worked at Duke for a long time is what Tom O'Brien did at State, and that you build hard nosed, tough defenses, uh, and you have a really good quarterback. And if you have those two things, I mean, you're not going to be great, but you'll be competitive and you'll go to bowl games. But uh, Duke just has not had a a legitimate quarterback in a number of years now, which is amazing because Cut is such a quarterback guy, but they have. They've just not been able to land the players that 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 really he's been able to, to do much with. And you combine that with the absolute dearth of talent on defense, and that's that's a death knell. You you can't you can't not have a defense and not have a quarterback. He's he's had guys that can play, and he's but I think last year they thought they had a quarterback, and he turned out to be he was either terrible or Duke made him terrible. I thought he looked good in spot minutes at Clemson, but yeah, it's a little bit different there. So Duke across the board uh, is wins. Georgia State a tougher game. Yeah, somebody on the chat, Greg said, "Is Georgia State a tougher game than Duke?" <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, we could dive into that one for sure. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's wait until we get. It's a conversation. Duke. Georgia it's a State conversation. Beat App, right? Last year. Yeah, and it's a conversation yeah, right. we'll have come Duke week, I think, but it's a little preliminary, a pre little premature. Somebody did make a good point. Uh, Cutcliffe has ridden the Peyton Manning train for 23 years, uh, but I, I do think he's a good coach. It's just it's Duke, man. It's Duke football. They haven't been relevant since he's got a start wife's grandfather. In the NFL. Yeah, I mean they're not. They have not been without talent, but it's Duke. All right, FSU in Chapel Hill. 
Uh, let's see who I want to go with. I think I'll go with the guy that knows a little bit about Florida State, and that's Jason Staples. Um, I will. I'll get on record first. If Carolina will not lose to Florida State this year, even though Mac has a problem beating Virginia and Florida State, proven track record of not being able to beat those guys. Not so fast this year. I got a W over Florida State. Jason, lead it off. I think this is the year that Mac finally beats his alma mater. <laughs> So, you know, he's never done it. And it's a game I know means a ton to him. Uh, and, you know, again, a guy that, that uh, has fond memories of his time in Tallahassee. And, you know, when you have that, you want to beat your team. <laughs> and, um, and I think that this is the year that, that they're most likely to get that done. In Chapel Hill, I think, you know, after the Duke game, they're going to, you know, it's like coming off a bye. Uh, and, you know, they're going <laughs> to wow. have, they're going to be, they should be fresh. And I think they, they match up pretty well with what Florida state does. I think Florida state's going to have trouble getting to six wins this year, uh, given their schedule. I mean, I think they're going to be better than they were last year overall, but, uh, but I think they're going to, you know, they're, they're pretty, they're pretty thin across the board on both lines. And I think Carolina's got advantages on the line of scrimmage and at the quarterback position. And normally you take that bet. And frankly, last year, Carolina should have won that game. I mean, even even where it was, I mean, they were in position to win the game late. A couple drops at the end don't happen, and they win that game late despite some huge breaks that Florida State got early. So Carolina was the better team last year. I think they'll be the better team this year. And I, I think uh, Mac finally breaks through against his and my alma mater. Yep. I love Mackenzie Milton. They still haven't named a starting quarterback, but Mackenzie Milton. Jordan Travis. Yeah, it's you think be so? Travis. Really? He has, I mean, Mackenzie Milton hasn't well, practiced enough. Well, he's practiced some, but he do, he does still have some foot problems right now, and he's right now more of a I think he's more of a spot guy that they're gonna they're gonna use. But the other thing is KZ is not quite as good as his reputation. I went back and watched the, the all 22 from the year that he was at UCF and put mm-hmm. up filthy numbers. And he got a lot of help that year. Uh, the, the accuracy and, other, and, and some other things was not as good as I expected given the numbers he put up. So, I mean, he's a good player, but he's not, uh, you know, a Heisman type, type quarterback even before the, the injury. And he would have to be for, for this Florida State team to really – yeah, yeah. Whether it whether it is Milton or Travis, I don't think either one of those guys goes into Chapel Hill and wins this game. Um, I know Jason could speak to it a lot more, but they've hit the transfer part portal extremely hard on the defensive side of the ball, just because they really needed to with how bad they are on the defensive side of the ball. So and then offensively, I don't, I don't. None of their skill position guys should really put any any fear in your heart. They're they're leading returner. I mean, they're leading returner for rushing the ball is like 400, 500 yards. Uh, a lot of unproven guys at the wide receiver position. Carolina's secondary is loaded with a lot of good cover corners. I think you have the factor that this team lost to Florida State last year, adding in. So I think Carolina wins this game and keeps keeps the wins coming. Just a, a number to put out there for you. 58% of Florida State's too deep are guys who are in their first or second year with the program. Uh, good, especially considering what's all going on off the field for the last 18 months. But I mean, six, just under 60% of your too deep was not on the roster two years ago. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> Buck Sanders, Florida State in Chapel Hill. There have been some epic games between these two in Chapel Hill. Um, and Carolina hasn't seemed to to come out on top on all but one. What do you say happens here? Yeah, anything could happen, but I, I don't think a win for Florida State is going to happen in this game. Um, at, at this point, we can be talking about, um, honestly, North Carolina should be about hitting their stride when it comes to this game. Uh, you know, it, maybe sometimes it takes a little while to get your all your rhythm and timing and all of that down offensively. Uh, I think some of the younger defensive players will be in a position where they're more able to contribute um, starting about the Florida State game. Uh, you're coming off, as somebody said, uh, derisively, 
sort of a bye week against Duke of sorts. So I, I don't think uh, North Carolina is going to lose the Florida State game. Um, I think these last six games is is where the rubber meets the road uh, for the most part. So uh, we'll, we'll uh, several people in this uh, group have North Carolina undefeated at this point, and uh, we'll just see if that's going to hold up through the rest of the second half of the schedule in this prediction pod. Gregory Hall, Florida State, Carolina, and Chapel Hill. I've got this as a W um, for basically all the reasons said, considering just Florida State, they're just uh, just not there. And I believe they're coming off of a – I'm looking at their – I don't remember their schedule. Um, let me pull it up real quick. I believe they're coming off of a tough game. Eh, not really. They played – never mind. They played Syracuse right beforehand. I'm thinking of somebody else. So that doesn't matter. But I still have it as a win. I've got UNC 6-0 and going into the halfway point. Right up there. I mean, depending on what goes on around them, that could be – they could be sitting around top five. Prob- they'll probably be like sixth or seventh at that point. But that's where I've got them. Greg Barnes, does losing to Florida State last year add more fuel or more pressure fuel. for this game? Fuel, for sure. You know, as we mentioned earlier, really believe that North Carolina lost the Virginia game because they lost in the trenches. And that Virginia that night was the better team. I think the FSU loss was a, a mixture of nerves and just some, some bad plays that went in FSU's favor. Um, and that North Carolina should not have lost that game. And uh, so, yeah, I've, I've got North Carolina winning this one pretty handily. I will say, though, I, I, I hope Milton McKenzie is able, able to play. Um, I think that's just a fantastic story if he's able to come back after what he went through. And I hope that Scott Frost has a massive NIL deal uh, on the side for Milton because uh, he got Scott Frost that Nebraska job. And he's not going to be there very long in Lincoln, but at least he should give Milton a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of cash flow to, to help him get through his time in Tallahassee. That's a good point. One Greg. other thing that, that I'll mention about the, the Florida State game from last year is that I think Florida State caught him about three or four different times with a few sort of surprises scheme-wise scheme, scheme wise, uh, that they, they just kind of caught him with their pants down a couple times. And I, I don't think that's likely to happen two years in a row the same the same way that it did and that that really was was critical in that game uh and you know that was that's that's I think what led to Florida State winning that game as much as anything else and that was on both sides of the ball they they had kind of circled that game and there were a handful of plays where they just caught him and I think this that that's unlikely to happen two years in a row that was what was interesting to me is that North Carolina team looked completely out of sorts against us. just a bad, bad Florida State team, and I don't see it happening. But this next game that we're going to talk about, and I'm going to start with you, Greg Barnes, I just – I find it hard to believe that people continue to put Miami up, you know, ahead of Carolina, quite frankly, when they're picking the ACC or picking the Coastal or whatever, given what happened last year. I know the players are different. I was not impressed with De'Eric King against Carolina. Um, he's coming off a major injury, Greg, Miami and Chapel Hill. I will say this. I do not like the schedule for Carolina this year. I don't like the three straight home games in October. And then the, the ones we're about to talk about, I think that could have been jumbled up a little better, but third straight home game, Miami and Chapel Hill, it's bound to be a night game. It's bound to be on fire in Kenan stadium. Greg, how's it shake out? Yeah. And I believe Miami has got a buy the week before. Um, which which they obviously do. is a, a benefit for the Hurricanes. Um, yeah, you know, it is interesting that, that Miami has gotten as much hype as they have, uh, especially with how Manny Diaz handled the defensive situation in the offseason, got rid of a lot of guys. I think he's a play caller now again. Uh, didn't work out well when he was with Mac in Texas in 2013. Um, I'm still waiting to see uh, how good of a coach Manny is. I, I think to beat North Carolina – as I've said before, you're going to have to be uh, maybe not elite. You've got to be very good in the trenches, especially on the defensive line. Miami lost three defensive ends to the NFL. Um, and it's not like this Miami team is quite ready to just uh, replace with other elite guys. Just not there yet. 
And so I just have a hard time seeing Miami uh, being able to win this game. I, I do think Miami is going to be good. I mean, Miami was good last year. I think the, the Carolina game uh, discolors a lot of that. I mean, Miami finished third in the ACC. Uh, I think people tend to forget that sometimes ahead of North Carolina, even though Carolina won that game. Uh, so it's, it's a good team. I love Derek King. I think that style of play is, is just fun to watch. I think he's going to have a, a very good year this year. I think the offense is going to be solid. I think Rhett Lashley, good coach. Uh, question marks with the defense and with how Sam Howe really kind of ate their lunch last year. I think with this game being in Keenan, with meaning so much, I think this will decide the Coastal. And I, I think Carolina is going to be able to pull this one out. It'll probably be a close game. I mean, I do think it's a big game. I just think North Carolina has too much in his favor. Uh, Buck Sanders, Carolina and Miami. It's always fun when these two get together in Keenan Stadium. What happens? Well, certainly I think the Miami game is uh, probably from a standpoint of advanced metrics is the hardest game North Carolina will play this game. That's where everybody's got it at. Uh, the, the FPI, although they uh, favor Notre Dame by a little higher probability, one game's at home, one's on the road. And essentially, they see those games as sort of toss-ups. You have to remember, though, what happened against Miami last year. Um, Javante Williams happened to Miami last year. And Michael Carter happened to Miami last year. They couldn't tackle either one of those guys. Oh, no. Uh, um, so oh, no. Um, that's, that's the problem there. What, what happened? No, it's twas, just, uh, twas ugly. Yeah, it was ugly. We're we're talking about. You remember the uh, the the UNC social media team releasing the oh no video of uh, of <laughs> yeah of Javante Williams Javante working yeah. working through that that Miami secondary. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was, I, that, I was think, that was classic. I think the first play of the game, if folks will go back and watch the first play of the game, I think Michael Carter got 12, 15 yards, and the announcers were like, okay, uh, <laughs> all right. And that was the very first play of that game. But anyway, but sorry to cut yeah. you off. Well, it, you know, so we'll see, you know, how much of that run game is still there uh, in 2021. I don't think it'll be quite to that level. Um, and so we'll see. It'll be – should be a closer game. Uh, the advanced metrics has it as a close game. Um, something about playing Miami at night has always been good to UNC for whatever reason. Uh, if they can get Miami coming in there at night on a, on a Saturday night and get a full house, uh, that has always worked to UNC's favor. So for this game, I'm going to give North Carolina the W as well. But uh, again, North Carolina needs to be near its peak offensive performance area uh, when uh, hurricanes come to town. Oof. Or mind us if hurricanes come to town. I Bucks think it's Virginia first Tech. Seven and now. Bucks our first seven and oh. Let's go to Taylor Vipolis where he can come in as the second one if he so chooses. I will join him in that seven and oh crew. <laughs> from his, I think this from is his my Hyatt, from his Hyatt over there. He's at seven and oh. <laughs> I think I think this, if you're looking at that college game day schedule, I think this is a great chance for Carolina to finally host a college game day. With Miami, they're they're obviously going to lose to the University of Alabama week one, um, but I think they'll they could run the schedule up until this North Carolina game. Like Greg mentioned, I really do like Derek King. I think when you talk to people on both teams, both teams are like we we don't really know what exactly happened last year. Like I I think a lot of Carolina fans are looking at that game and being like, this is how this series should be going. But I think these two teams are a lot closer. One stat I saw, Manny Diaz after a bye, one in four. So having a bye is great. I agree. Having so coaches do. that know what to do with a bye is even better. So I'm I'm not somebody who believes in Manny Diaz. Um, I think every year people are going to hype up Miami, but the, the the days are long gone when Miami comes to town and the other team across from them is is afraid of them or backing down from the trash talk. This is this North Carolina team. Like if they had to choose one game on the schedule that they're really looking forward to play, it's that Miami game. They they love the big lights. They love 
the opponents thinking that they have some kind of mental advantage just because of a U on their helmet. They love throwing down the U, um, much to this, the dismay of every Hurricane fan. Um, but I think I think this North Carolina team keeps the ball rolling and they win they win uh, home against Miami. Do we think Miami is a top fifteen team at this point? I think Alabama's going destroy their season yeah just but like I don't they think did that, florida state i don't think that'll destroy their season i mean alabama is supposed to win that game well, florida state because florida remember, state has not been the same program since alabama destroyed them well they didn't and the thing is they didn't destroy them what happened is they they hurt florida state's quarterback in that game florida state was actually in position to win that game in the third quarter and then turned it over alabama scored and then turned it over again, and their quarterback got hurt, and that was the season because they didn't have any quarterback depth. Now, where the where Bama could end Miami's season is Miami similarly is dependent on one guy at quarterback, and that's the real question: is is De'Eric King healthy at this point in the season? Injury prone too. Well, he runs the ball so much, so is he going to be healthy? You know, I, I also I think people ought to be aware. You, Miami gets a lot of ink, no question, and maybe more than they deserve. But from a talent perspective, um, they've got two five stars on their team and forty-two four stars. They've actually rebuilt some talent there. Uh, you know that they almost uh, North Carolina, I think, has twenty-seven four stars and two five stars. Uh, but in terms of talent. You know, they've got a ton of ability down there in South Florida. They're in a a recruiting hotbed. Everybody knows that. And they're going to get most of the great talent coming out of South Florida. So it's not as though, and I think, I do think that, and again, the jury's out on on Manny Diaz, but Miami long-term and even midterm, short-term, if you will, poses the greatest threat to North Carolina in, in terms of North Carolina building some separation in the coastal division um, over its uh, coastal division foes. So, uh, but they, they've got talent down there. Don't, don't get confused about that. Uh, I've got Carolina beating Miami. Jason, what you got? And this is, this is a really tough one for me because again, I'm searching for L's on this schedule. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a big part of this. Uh, and it's hard for me to pick Miami in anything for certain reasons. And I also know that, um, Mac Brown is Manny Diaz's daddy. I mean, that's just been the fact. And you look at what he did to Manny last year, you know, Mac, Mac, clearly knows something about how Manny's deep about something, something that Manny doesn't do right because of his experience watching BYU put up like 400 plus, or it was close to 500 rushing yards on his Texas team when Manny was defensive coordinator there. And last year, Matt got his comeuppance and saying, you see how that feels when you're the head coach and somebody does this to you. Here's the problem, though, is that I don't see Javante Williams and Michael Carter on this on on this Carolina offense to do that. I think Miami is going to be better prepared for that. I've got to search for an L on this schedule, and I think this is maybe the most likely talent wise on the schedule. Uh, So all that said, I'm going to I'm going to go with this as another loss for Carolina, even though it's very painful for me to do so. And I'm kind of working against my nature, both for. Uh, both in terms of coaching matchup and in terms of, you know, certain things built into the genetic code. But uh, I'm, I'm going to go with Miami to win this game, it, but close. Uh, Gregory Hill. Coastal chaos. I've got UNC, Pitt, and Miami all in this, like, jumbled up scenario this season. So I've got Miami – winning this game. Gregory Hall with the L, a red L for Carolina on this. Uh here we go. And this there is was three. This is the uh <laughs> I've got a lot of pressure on the YouTube chat. We got yeah I'm everyone in the YouTube is chanting for twelve <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to feel it a little bit. Uh 
you know, looking at the first seven weeks of the season prior to the bye week, Jason Staples has got Carolina losing two at home in Keenan Stadium. I don't see it happening. I uh, I would love to not see it happen. I, I just think away, yes, I'll give you that. And we're about to get to some important away games. Um, but we're going to bye week. So for the bye week, let's ask a question. And I'll ask uh, Gregory – no, I'll ask Greg and Jason this. And Vip, you can chime in as well. Recruiting for Carolina. Mac Brown's been rolling in the recruiting. What position does he really need to recruit more and better to keep the trajectory going up? Greg Barnes. I think we're, we're looking at kind of a mirror image of, of what happened in Mac 1.0, right? And that – the reason North Carolina was not able to topple Bobby Bowden and Florida state in 96 and 97, because he didn't have the offensive line. Now he, he didn't have Sam Howell either. Uh, Mac knows how to recruit defensive players. Um, and if you look at the talent coming in defensively, they're going to be a okay. And when you've got quarterbacks like Chris, well, and Drake may and Sam Howell, you're doing pretty good there with the scheme that Phil Longo has. Uh, but I think it's offensive line. And if you look at, some of the metrics, uh, one of the uh, I see subscriber uh, premium board guys, uh, he's going to kill me if I don't get his username right, but Tar, what, Tar Hills 44 maybe. Uh, he does a lot of these uh, data compilations with recruiting, and they're fantastic. I, I recommend you checking them out on the premium board. Uh, but it's a pretty stark discrepancy between basically every position and then offensive line. And the offensive line – you know, the best players have been Larry Fedora's guys. Uh, now, you you need a guy like Zach Rice, right, to kind of change that. But I, I think offensive line clearly is, is where New York, North Carolina needs to make some significant strides to really be able to reach that next level. Jason, you agree with that? I'm actually going to disagree with Greg for one of the rare occasions here. Partly because I'm I'm a firm believer that that on the offensive line, offensive line is a development position and it's a position that you need to recruit with numbers. And all you have to do is look at Carolina as a, as an as an example of that of some of the guys that they landed in the Fedora era. If you'd blindfolded all of us, and you know we hadn't been able to see the last couple of years, and we knew base we knew who those recruits had been, we were just told. These are the offensive line recruits that have been brought in. Here's what they were ranked in high school and all of that. We would be thinking that this year, Carolina would be coming into the year with a potential All-American at on the offensive line named Barnes. Because that's the highest rated recruit they've, they've landed on the offensive line in years. And yet he's like the seventh or eighth guy on the offensive line. It's just taken him, taken him a little longer to develop and he may still pan out into that kind of player maybe but some of the guys that were three stars and really not well not super highly regarded blossomed when they got on campus and it's just one of those positions where it's the it's the position with the least correlation between high recruiting uh, you know being highly thought of recruiting wise and uh, panning out in college, partly because it's really hard to evaluate. And a lot of the guys who evaluate for, for these kinds of sites don't do as good a job on the offensive line as, as what they do on, on some other positions. I mean, it's really easy to see who the best running backs are. It's a lot harder to be able to tell on a field where there's one college player out there, like how good is this offensive lineman really in terms of projecting? But, but I mean, yeah, they need to continue to gain, to, to add, uh, numbers and bring in guys that can develop but you know i look at a guy like like caden baker somebody like that from last year i think he's got all the development potential in the world you know it's a matter of can you keep those guys healthy when they're young and develop them into players by the time they're you know sophomore redshirt sophomores redshirt juniors and i think they're in position to, to do that so that's I'm, I'm not that uncomfortable with where they are in terms of offensive line i think they're they're fine there really to me in this era you need to to do what clemson's done in terms of your 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 recruiting emphasis which is you have to recruit the quarterback position really well which mac has done they they've got quarterback talent on the roster and then you've got to just pour tons of resources into getting the best defensive lineman on campus that you can and to me adding another 
elite defensive tackle or edge rusher to what they've already got just takes them that much further into the elite territory. I mean, I know they already got maybe the best defensive tackle prospect in the country committed. Add one more of those. (laughs) And that makes a much bigger difference than adding, you know, a guy that is ranked really highly on the offensive line. Uh, The other thing, the, the place where I think they could improve though, more uh, more than the other places is at the wide receiver position. And that's something that um, may surprise people. But if you look at the Clemson model, they've kind of moneyballed it in terms of they've not necessarily recruited, you know, the, the top top uh, uh, ranked guys at a lot of other positions, but they've landed quarterbacks, receivers and defensive linemen at a, at a disproportionate rate in terms of elite players. And an elite receiver changes so much for you because of what it does to coverage and what it does to, to defenses in this era. And you can move that guy around and really cause problems. And those guys can change the scoreboard if they can run. And so that's the other place that I'd like to see maybe just a little bit more elite talent show up is can they land, you know, the, the, the Clemson or Alabama level wide receiver to add to the quarterback talent that they've got? Because again, you go back to the nineties, Mac 1.0 yeah the offensive line couldn't handle that Florida State defensive line that was a big difference but Florida State's offensive line didn't have a great time against Carolina's defensive line either the real difference in those games was Peter Warwick EG Green and some of those guys that Carolina just didn't have those guys at wide receiver and you know obviously the quarterback position as well so to me get a couple game breakers and continue doing what you're doing at quarterback and, and and defensive line and you're in position to to make the playoff yeah, look what Alabama's done with game changer wide receivers lately. Vip, uh, briefly, position Carolina needs. Is there anything left to be said there? I think it's quarterback, defensive line. Jason tosses in the wide receiver. Where are you on that? Yeah, I would go quarterback and defensive line. You just look what Clemson does. Like Clemson is the model where you go from Taj Boyd to Deshaun Watson to Kelly Bryant to Trevor Lawrence to now DJ. It seems like and the same thing with Alabama, like when was the last time you saw an Alabama quarterback go out on the field and you're like, oh, wow, Nick Saban really missed on this guy. It's like every year they're churning out like the best of the best at quarterback and then along the defensive line. So I would agree with Jason with what he was saying there. All right, boys, we're moving into the second half of the season after the bye week. Buck Sanders, Notre Dame in South Bend, October 30th, day before Halloween. Carolina goes up there. By your count, by my count, by VIP's count, undefeated, probably ranked in the top five. Um, Is this, should that happen? Is this the biggest game in Carolina football history that you can think of, save maybe the Florida State game in 97? And what do you have it coming out as? Well, I'm going to cut to the chase quickly on the outcome. I think North Carolina loses this game. and I kind of go back to the uh, my philosophical kind of point of view and one that Greg Barnes also follows a great bit that uh, until North Carolina can prove that they can do it, you can't really go uh, with uh, picking the W there. And, you know, I, I think that uh, Notre Dame is not the same team that they were last year. I think they lose a great bit. But they're also in the back half of their schedule. And they've got good coaching. They'll be able to develop some players the same as North Carolina will. Uh, It'll be a huge game. I think one of the uh, hidden advantages that North Carolina has is that Notre Dame plays Southern Cal the week before, which is a huge rivalry game. And, you know, I, I, who was the coach that said, you know, you just can't treat every game like you come out of the tunnel and pull the head off a chicken or whatever uh, to get the, <laughs> uh, the crowd fired up. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't know how juiced North, uh, Notre Dame is going to be for North Carolina following the Southern Cal game. And I'll, I guess that depends somewhat on Southern Cal's season. Uh, North Carolina could be viewed as a bigger game. I doubt it will be because of the historical rivalry between those two. But I, I'm going to pick North Carolina for the L there. Um, really leaning in more to uh, if they haven't done it before, it's hard to predict that they are going to do it. 
I'm not going yet. Uh, I'm Gregory <laughs> Hall. I'll let you go first. So I am on the other side of the spectrum of Buck. I've got this as a W because they haven't done it before and because they're playing Southern Cal the week before. And I still think Notre Dame – I know it's week nine. I guess this would be week nine. And I, I, I know it's hard to say that they Notre Dame will still be reeling from their beat down against Clemson and then against Alabama in the college football playoff. But I think that kind of affects their entire year this year, especially with all the pundits of, oh, Notre Dame doesn't, just shouldn't be there, blah, 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 blah. And I have UNC coming off a loss to Miami. They know that if they want to still stay up there in the national polls that they need to win this game. So I have UNC going on the road, making up for the Miami loss, getting that win over Notre Dame that Mac talks about a lot as far as why they lost to Notre Dame with size up front and depth and things like that. And they have all of that stuff this year. So that's why I've got a win for the Tar Heels this week. Interesting. I, I think the most impressive thing for me for Notre Dame last year is lose those two offensive linemen, didn't skip a beat. Uh, but Vip, you're up. Notre Dame, Carolina up there. Yeah, one thing Notre Dame always has, it's the, the bodies ready in the trenches. And I think I would have both of these teams undefeated going into this game. So I don't think this is a case of um, Notre Dame uh, or North Carolina catching Notre Dame sleeping if, if they're coming in a 7-0 and team ranked top five, top 10. I think North Carolina, they're, they're trending towards having a top 20 offensive line, top 20 defensive line. But I think that no matter who Notre Dame kind of plugs in right now, that Notre Dame is going to be right there. Now they're replacing Ian book who I love the Ian book at um, Notre Dame. They got the, I think the Wisconsin transfer Jack Cohn. Um, I just, I just see this being a loss for North Carolina um so yeah i'm I'm getting off the the oh, w no. train but i think this is going to be a, a really tough game i really like um notre dame's running back kyron uh, williams he was a, a doak walker uh semi-finalist last year i think he's going to be a, a doak walker finalist this year he's he's just as good as any running back in the country and i think we kind of saw that last year where he he rushed for well over 100 yards against carolina that's 23 right and he 23 for Notre Dame. He uh, he played great last year in this game. Yeah, he uh, the one thing about Notre Dame is Book was just ridiculous against Carolina last year. We'll see about the Wisconsin transfer, but I'm not going yet. Greg Barnes, Notre Dame, Carolina. A lot of pressure on Tommy with this. I'm, thing, I'm extremely. Chad big. gave him too much power at this. Point. I think he I'm being threatened. Where he goes. Um, and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think Vip and, and Buck uh, pretty much laid it out there. The fact that Notre Dame lost 14 players who signed NFL deals is staggering. But Brian Kelly has been there for a very long time. He's stockpiled talent. Um, and, and just like we saw with the offensive line bill last year, they can just plug guys in. And the fact that we are talking about a game that's going to occur on Halloween weekend – they're going to have plenty of opportunities to kind of get these guys ready to play. Um, I think Jack Cohn being named starter is very conservative, which maybe that helps North Carolina here, as well as the fact that while Notre Dame has Southern Cal the week before, North Carolina is coming off a, a bye week. Uh, so that, that's a dynamic there that's, that's worth looking at. Um, but I just think, I think this is going to be a tough game for North Carolina to win on the road. Oh. This, is, this is going to be very important. Uh, with the college football playoff race, this is going to be very important with the New Year's Six bowl game situation. Um, and I, I've got this as North Carolina's second loss of the year. Y'all suck. Is, <laughs> is anybody going to agree with me? I'm going to agree with you. Look, Carolina coming off a of bye week, they've got to be healthy going into this game. I, I think that, um, of course, at this point in the season, nobody's truly healthy, but I think. This right here is why Mac Brown came back to Chapel Hill. I don't think it's relevant to Carolina's, uh, maybe even Carolina's playoff stuff if they're undefeated and they lose this game um, because they still got to beat Clemson in the ACC championship. But I think Carolina goes up there. Carolina should have beat them, was it 14? Roughing the snapper, snapper when Carolina yeah. was not a good team. Uh, I mean, y'all were all right. Sorry, Vip. 
y'all weren't Notre Dame good and still couldn't get the it done. The defense sucks. The, the offense yeah. was good. Yeah, I, I, I mean, that they, Carolina should have won that game. I think this year, assuming everybody's healthy, and I know that's a big caveat, I'm going with a W. For one, I'm going to be there. For two, I've got Notre Dame friends that I'm tired of hearing from um, every time Carolina plays. And three, I just think this is the game Mac Brown's built towards. Uh, winning Carolina winning on the road on it doesn't get any better people can talk about what they want about Notre Dame football whatever you want to say they deserve see uh, playoff berths or whatever Notre Dame is the college football team uh, aside from Alabama and Carolina goes up there to South Bend in front of everybody and touchdown Jesus and gets a W to go what eight no at this point in the season Tommy I I'm, might have to clip that for socials that was that was, that was a good rant. That was a good. That was. I also was going to say I have uh, I have no problem with you saying it was a, a bad football team after <laughs> seeing ECU put up seventy points in Greenville. Vip, that was my. I will never forget oh. breaking down one of the plays from that ECU game, and you had both the safety and the corner covering the flat, and both wide receivers from their side of the field running verticals with no one on the screen. Was that third and 31 and it, or fourth and 31 went for like 50 and a touchdown? Anyway. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Jason, <laughs> stay in the moment. We got a prediction. You, you're you still up for Notre Dame, Carolina, up in South Bend on Halloween Eve. It's been a lot of great points so far. Um, Notre Dame did lose a ton of talent. And, again, Brian Kelly has that program in a place where they're, they've been reloading for a while. And so you can't just assume that they're they're – well, you know, they lost 14 guys who are now, you know, who now signed NFL contracts. That's a win. But I think Carolina wins this game. So, uh, and, and the reason for that is, I, I think, Tommy, you're right in that this is a game that in terms of building towards stuff specifically with what they've got on this roster, I look at the matchups here and I go, you know, what did Carolina competed with Notre Dame last year? with a better Notre Dame team big time. And what was it that they just couldn't get over the hump with against that Notre Dame team? Right. They Short couldn't affair. stop the run because that, that set of offensive linemen, which was one of the top two offensive lines in the country dominated the line of scrimmage against it of significantly undersized and banged up North Carolina defensive line. This is the game at this point in the season coming off the bye week, which I think is important, not because Carolina is going to be healthy, but because that allows you, it's the bye week. And I've preached this for a while. It's the bye week, the mid season bye, where you can actually start to get your young talent. That's kind of been repping a little bit in practice and all of that. And they've gotten some reps in the game, but they've not been quite ready. It's after that bye week that you see the young talent really start to be able to play for a team. This is the game where you start to see somebody like Javari Ritzy come off the come off the bench and make a couple plays. This is the game where some of that young talent on the defensive line, and you look at a guy like uh, Des Lawrence on, on the edge. You look at those guys, and that's a different Carolina defense up front at this point in the year with the depth that they've got being able to trot out a bunch of 300 pounders against what Notre Dame likes to do. And Notre Dame, see Miami likes to spread you out and they'll try to run on you. Sure. But they're going to, they're going to make you put smaller personnel on the field and then try to run on you that way. Notre Dame wants to get into a phone booth and, and bludgeon you. And I think this North Carolina defense is actually going to be pretty well equipped to handle that aspect of what Notre Dame does I think this is a place where Conley's ability at the safety position and what you've got in terms of Eugene Asante at linebacker, so much of, of, the, of the Notre Dame passing game is going to run through the tight end. Those two guys are going to be really important defensively. I think Carolina is going to be able to slow them down, and I think the other big question mark right now in, 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 uh, in uh, South Bend is the cornerback position. Well, Sam Howell, and by that point, you should have a pretty established and healthy set of wide receivers. I just think matchups, matchups wise, and in terms of other things, this is the game that I think uh, Carolina can come in and make a statement and win this game. Jason, do you think Tamon Fox gets a snap at defensive end in the Notre Dame game? I think he gets snaps 
on the edge at that outside linebacker position, which is what I would call the true end. But he ain't going to be getting snaps up, you know, lined up right. uh, between the guard and the tackle like he did last year. You're going to be seeing a guy like Ritzy and other guys in that spot at this stage of the season. And you're looking at a 40 pound difference. It's just, it's, you can't, you can't really, it, it's hard to overstate how big of a difference that is defensively. And, and I think Jay Bateman is going to earn his every bit of his paycheck in this game. That's yeah, why I have Tommy, to see winning. Tommy, I want to add this, this comment in just because it's relevant to what Jason just said. I, I think a lot of people make the mistake of saying, okay, well, North Carolina has a lot more depth up front. Therefore, they won't run out of gas necessarily like they did against a and and Notre Dame. Um, and I asked Jay Bateman with regard to you know, defending running quarterbacks, for example, if just having more depth helps solve that issue. And he made an important point that not necessarily more depth helps, but you still have to have guys that are able to set the edge. You still have to have guys that can get into the gaps and really create uh, confusion, really create uh, one-on-one situations that they can win to be able to stop a running quarterback, to be able to stop the run in general. Um, And so the depth helps. What really helps more than the depth is having more guys that are capable and who have the talent to make these types of plays. So there's, there's a distinction there that I think is important. Yeah. It's quality depth. That's the difference. It's not just more bodies. When you're adding guys like Ritzy to that, to that mix and those guys are getting on the field that changes your talent complexion. The other thing that really helps them here is again, Ian book made plays with his feet last year when they were in position that I don't think Jack Cone, I mean, look, Cone may be a better passer from the pocket. I don't think he's going to be making those kinds of plays. So, you know, the kinds of stuff where you have to deal with a running quarterback, it's a different team. And I think this Notre Dame team is going to have a few extra losses this year, even though they're going to be a good team. And I think one of those losses is going to be to Carolina. Mm-mm-mm. Wake up, Vip. Wake Forest comes to Kenyon Stadium. Another not. Yeah, you like that. Wake up, Wake Forest. Vipolis non-conference game. Uh, still weird to me. But what do you think about this team coming? I, look, I like. I've always liked Wake Forest football for some reason. I've always thought they were pretty good, and they beat up on the team in West Raleigh, which is always enjoyable too. But Wake and Keenan. Yeah, I think I was the only person who picked Wake Forest to win last year, and I remember thinking rightfully so. halfway through that third quarter when they were up by 21, it wasn't looking like that bad of a pick all of a sudden that I remember getting a lot of flack. I think Sam Hartman is a quarterback who can go into um, – who can go into an environment and win you a game. I think he is a good quarterback. He doesn't have the the wide receivers that he might've had last year or the past two years with um, Washington and Surratt. But I think overall he is a good quarterback. And that's, that's mostly what I'm looking at when I'm picking teams is do I think this team has a quarterback that can will a team to victory? With that being said, I don't think North Carolina loses to Wake Forest. I think North Carolina has a, a huge talent advantage over Wake um, so I think North Carolina, after losing to Notre Dame, I think they get back on the, the winning track. Wait a minute. Sam Hartman's still at Wake Forest. I, I freely admit I do not research teams until a couple weeks before. Is he still there? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that guy's yes. been there. Like He's still like – You just said like, you love Wake Forest. I, mean, I do love him, but I, it doesn't matter this, who plays quarterback. We're going to have this conversation for a few more years too because that COVID-free year is going to completely change the the – the impression of how long certain guys have been. I mean, you're going to have six year guys all over the place at different places. And wake will be one of those. That's a, that's a foreshadowing. Let me just sneak that in there. A foreshadow Buck Sanders, wait for us in Carolina. Yeah. I think Hartman is still throwing passes to Michael Campanero <laughs> uh, over the middle. Th- over the middle. I think he just scored another <laughs> touchdown. And uh, I will guarantee you that one receiver will not beat Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> How long has that been? Five, been six a, years ago. It's been a while. Hartman's uh, going into his redshirt sophomore year again. Yeah. Well, in, in any event, uh, <laughs> I, I don't think that uh, North Carolina loses to Wake Forest this year at home. Uh, so I'm gonna, just going to give them a win. And I don't really know um, how much I need to – more I need to say about this. Mac Brown has always placed a huge emphasis on beating every – in-state team mm-hmm. that he plays and and i think he will 
it's Wake Forest, and maybe they're not the biggest threat on the uh, schedule, but he'll he'll have the Tar Heels ready to play them at home, uh, back end of the schedule. Jason Staples, this is a trap. This is a trap, and this was this was bet- it was between this one and the Virginia game on which ones I which what my choice for that sort of upset loss was going to be on the schedule, and and part of the reason for that is uh, Clawson has been pretty. Uh, adamant behind the scenes that this is the best team he's had at Wake Forest. He really thinks this is a good team. So, I mean, I've been, I've been turning over whether I should flip that Virginia pick or not. Ever since I said anything, I'm going to stick with it and I'm going to go with this being a, a win against Wake. But this one's one, this one's one I'm worried about as I go into the season. And it's, it's a, it's a tough one for a lot of reasons. And again, I'm really tempted to flip my Virginia and wake forest picks because again, this is a, this is a trap situation after what I think is going to be a highly emotional road win. And then you come back into this and it's, it's wake, but it's also an in-state team. And I think, you know, the, the talent differential is going to be pretty good. And I think they'll, they'll, they'll be able to, uh, to come out on, on, on top there. Gregory Hall W. Greg Barnes. Uh, I agree with a lot of the the concern. Uh, I mean, the fact that the Wake has so many players back. They had I think 19 starters back, and then two of the guys got hurt, season in injuries. Uh, but to have 17 guys back, including Hartman, you, if you're going to beat North Carolina, you've got to be good in the trenches, and you've got to be good offensively, and then that starts with your quarterback. And I think Hartman's a le- legitimate quarterback. Uh, they do that that lovely mesh, extended <sighs> mesh that everybody loves. So we'll get to see that again. Uh, That was effective for for most of the game last year. Uh, Yeah, I'm a big Dave Clawson fan. I think he's a great coach. I agree with with Vip. The the talent discrepancies is too much at this point in time. Um, Wake Wake can win this game. Uh, Somebody asked me earlier this week about a potential trap game. Coming off Notre Dame, this would probably be be it. Um, So there is concern here. But I, I think North Carolina, with this being a home game, uh, the Tar Heels take care of business. Drum roll yeah, for not- TA. Yeah, and, and uh, Taylor Taylor mentioned about the the retro sophomore again for Hartman. It just reminds me of that classic quote from PCU, which I think is thirty years old now. But Jeremy Pivens mentions that you're back in his third sophomore year. Uh, he had done something. This <laughs> is great. They ain't losing the weight for us. Put a W up there. At Pitt though concerns me. Uh, Ooh. You know, they've got, what, a sixth or seventh year starting quarterback here. I love Kenny Pickett. Big Kenny Pickett guy, too. Uh, so Vip, Vip okay, Vip. What's up. Lead it up, Vip. Pitt. At Pitt. Uh, Pitt is – I feel like those Thursday night games at Pitt, they're always weird. Pitt is always tough. Um, Pitt also just does, like – they'll just totally go against, like, any kind of game plan and – totally flip it out and that's why they always seem to win like one game a year where they really shouldn't and that would be a game like this North Carolina like this North Carolina game when you're looking at what both teams have on both sides of the ball but I'm going with a win for North Carolina and uh, getting back on the winning track when uh, you're looking at at Pitt I think they've they've lost maybe the last two times there I know they definitely lost the last time there um, but yeah, two last two times. Cause the last time they went there with Fedora, they lost uh, yep. pretty sure on a Thursday as well. Um, so those Thursday games have kind of been problems for North Carolina. I think the last time they won on a Thursday, there was the, the Marquise face mask game. Um, but I think North Carolina wins. They won on yeah. a Thursday in 2017. At Pitt? 34 to 31. Oh, wow. If they call targeting, uh, Two years ago, they don't lose that game because their best defensive players out. Buck at Pitt. Here's what irritates me about ACC and the scheduling here. If they would just schedule this game on a Saturday, I could go up there and see. And like in September, I could see the Pirates, Carolina and Pittsburgh Panthers, and then I could see the Steelers on a wonderful weekend in Pittsburgh. But they just refuse to give me that opportunity. But what happens in this ball game late in the season? Carolina's going to be probably be beat up by the point by this point. It's a short week at Pitt. Larry Fedora on the short weeks, less coaching, better results. Uh, but how does Carolina do in this one? But well, uh, 
I'm going to probably take some grief for it, but I've got this one down as a loss uh, because of the short week. Um, and here's the crazy part, which uh, Vip alluded to a little bit. The higher ranked North Carolina is going into this game, the better chance Pitt has of knocking them off because that's their MO. Um, like every year, Narducci has been there. I think they beat, they beat Clemson, uh, probably beat them on the road. I think they beat Miami when Miami was ranked number two in the nation. Um, they, uh, came within like a touchdown of beating Penn state, um, a year or two ago, they beat UCF last year, was it? Or a year before last. So, uh, they have this, uh, penchant for knocking off highly ranked teams and sucking the rest of the year. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I just think that this is, this is your trap game on the short week. Uh, Mac doesn't really have much history with Pitt. You know, it's not like he's going to say, well, it's Wake Forest. We have to beat these guys or in state, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so if, if they're going to go 10 and two in, uh, in 2021, the the best shot I think they have for getting that second loss is going to be at Pitt on a Thursday night. Um, and they've got a uh, experienced quarterback at Kenny Pickett. Uh, Narduzzi always plays good uh, offense. He's going to beg and cry for every offense or every flag from the, the official. Um, and uh, so I think this is their best chance for losing two games. Uh, in this schedule. Amen, Buck. Amen. All right, Junior, you're up, Gregory. Looking back at the history between these two teams, the last time this game wasn't decided by less than nine points was the year I was born, 1998. Oh, God. Jesus. Seven points, three <laughs> points, three points, one point, You know, I could have gone points, all night points, without points, knowing two that. Points. <laughs> Three points. It was not. Oh my bad. It was nineteen points in nineteen ninety eight. UNC beat Pitt. Since then, it hasn't been more than seven. So it's gonna be a. It's gonna be a close game. And Pitt's coming off playing Duke. I think we all can agree that's a pseudo bye week. UNC's coming off a game that they might have to try a little bit harder than they want to against Wake. I don't like it on the road. I can't give UNC. 5-0 and on the road. Um, as much as I want to say UNC is going to go 11-1, and considering the last time they went 11-1, and I think this team is better than that team, especially considering the opponents around them and things like that. But I just I can't give them a win here, and I've got them an L with Miami, so I've got them, I've got them a loss here. Uh, y'all are making me nervous. Jason Staples, pick it. Oh, man. See, this might be the one that I want to flip my Virginia pick for. Well, man, you flip hey, the Virginia stay pick. Stay strong. Time. Stay strong. <laughs> the, the board is furious at the two of you, by the way. Who? What, for Virginia? Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I figured that. I saw a comment that said, did they pick them to win any games? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, whatever. Um, I know Greg cares. Reminder about that we picked North Carolina to go six and six in 2019, and eight and three last year. So just, just saying. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Barnes bringing the heat. Hey, he's got yeah. his chest hair out today. This is the one. This is the one. That, this is my Ross that, shirt. This is the make or break game <laughs> in so many ways because this is it, it is so hard to win on a short week when you're on the road. It is really hard because you really only get two days practice, right? You, know, you don't, you don't get a full week. I mean, you get your Monday walkthrough and then you get really just Tuesday as a full, as a full true full day. And then when Wednesday you're traveling, that's really hard against the team that, you know, the home team actually gets that additional day essentially to, to practice. So I'm going to go with an L here and I'm, I'm, Ah, man, that's hard, but I'm going to go with a loss 
and flip me, put me down for a win against Virginia. Dang it. I, I just nope, couldn't. Nope, he, nope. You know, he oh, does this every year. Folks. Every year. Every I do year it. he does this. I do it because if I've got to find losses. Yeah. But I've got to find, it. I've got to find losses because. Leave it red, Gregory. Yeah. Oh, you okay, leave it okay, red. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine, but <laughs> I've got to find losses, and it's a matter of where that's going to be. And I had a hard time selling that that Virginia, I mean, um, that Virginia loss. All so. of your analysis for every other game, the Virginia loss didn't make sense when you were going when I, when you. When well, I mean, I, was I told you, to I, your I, Notre I, I Dame analysis. It didn't that. make sense to me. <laughs> when you when you think about college football, though, a lot of it. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. On, on, on no, I put that might not make sense pick, but this one is, I put is the one in the that chat. makes more sense, make sense as a loss. And you know what? Screw it. I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with a loss against Virginia and against Pitt, and we'll just make it easy. Hey, Jesus what? Christ! What? You don't have to do that. I'll just pick it on you. You know, no, you leave, go with hey, the W. Leave that W. Look, in. I, yeah, I, 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 I like the W. Until this show is over, what is it? Until the show is over, anybody can change whatever they need. All right. Okay. I'm, I'm going to stick with that. I'm going to stick with that W against Virginia. Sorry. Sorry, Greg. I'm going to leave you on That's that right. island. That's right. Okay. Let me read a, a post on the message board. These are demonstrably bad picks, fellas. Do better. <laughs> Quote, unquote. Tommy's got Carolina undefeated at the moment. I, really. <laughs> I, I bet everybody loves Tommy's pick. I know, really. The pander. Tommy, the pander. Tommy, Tommy is Dude, going the for the chat is all in. The chat is all in on 12 and I, uh, I will uh, – I've got free drinks coming. You know, I'm going to be at the Bowls <laughs> lot every year. I'm not going to bring any food or nothing. I'm going to eat all week. Greg Barnes <laughs> at Pittsburgh. <laughs> so, Jason mentioned a lot of these guys coming back and utilizing that extra year. Pittsburgh has 13 super seniors coming back. Who have played snaps? Uh, when you're talking about guys that are 22, 23 years old, that makes a difference. And Kenny Pickett's the same way. I think he's 26 by now. So I, that's going to be very important for this team to have that veteran leadership, to have guys they can count on. Yes, they lost some some key guys. Uh, Jones and Weaver were elite defensive ends. Those guys will be good at the next level. So you've got to make up for that. Narduzzi's a defensive coach, though, um, and I think he's done a really good job. If you look at what they did last year. Yeah, they were six and five, lost a couple games when, when Pickett was out due to injury, had a tough schedule, uh, a couple one point losses as well. So I, I think Pitt's going to be really good. They've got some guys, you know, Tessier Mack, for example. Uh, you know, I think he had surgery right before the year began last year. It was never who they thought he could be. He's healthy now. Jordan Addison had a great year last year. So the offense should be a lot better. The defense is going to be good. Uh, you know, Buck pointed out how uh, Pitt has done a really good job in some of these big games. I mean, another one was uh, they went up to South Bend when Notre Dame was number five, I think three or four years ago, uh, lost 19 to 14. So Narduzzi has a he, he does a good job getting his guys up for this type of game. Uh, I think this is one that North Carolina loses. All right. A couple things, Greg, when you walked out when Jason was pontificating, uh, you got quiet, so you need to turn your mic up a little bit. Okay. Part two, Carolina's not losing at Pittsburgh. Put a W down, Gregory. <laughs> We're going Sorry, Wofford. I was, I was reading the chat. Greg, what was – did you say a loss? Greg a said a loss, yes, and I, I want to make loss. sure I've got this right. You got North Carolina going nine and three in the regular well, season. Well, there's we still had a game. game. There's still we a have, week now. There's we, still a week yeah. 12, Buck. Wait a second. They have to go to NC State, Buck. Yeah, okay. All right, nine and two to this point. This is a better time. No, he's eight, eight and three. Eight and three. We're, say, we're, we're saying he could go eight and four. It just gets fortune worse. He could go eight and four. Yeah, turn up I mean, your mic, my, you my, to... my formula has him, going, has him with nine wins, so, you know, the by, by win share. So, All right. nine, 9.25. All right, so All right. we have a eight and three G Biggie, a nine and two El Presidente, a – 10 or 11 and 0 Tommy <laughs> Homer Ashley <laughs> a 10 and 1 Letterman a I don't even know what the age state is at yeah, it's either <laughs> eight and, it's either 8 and 3 or 10 or 9 and two, or uh, or what is it 8 and 2 or or uh we've got a Jason Staples' record is like one of those pictures that you turn and it's something different no matter how you yeah. turn it. <laughs> and then we've got myself sitting at 9-2 and two going into rivalry week. So 
Uh, how about Stables? I'll let you go first here. Put a W down. He ain't losing to NC State. Mac does not lose to NC State. What do you say, Gregory? I'm going to kick you first since you uh, I had to take Jason. your job. You, the amount of love that you're getting in the chat is not sitting well with me right now. So I had to take over your job for a second. Um, John Sparrow better come up with some – yeah, he owes me. Go ahead. You got a W for NC State, Gregor? Yes, I do. Um, when I was thinking about – I like I said, I just – I don't know. I wanted to, I want to flip the Miami game. I really do uh, because I <laughs> think this team is very capable of 11-1, and one, but I'm not going to. Um, and I had either at Pitt or at NC State as a guaranteed loss. And based on how UNC has handled the Wolfpack the last two years – it's just, yeah, it's just, and UNC is going to be trying to get that ACC championship spot, which they can do with losses to Miami and Pitt. I believe they can do that. Um, I've got this as a W. Have y'all seen the Doran TikTok where uh, he riffs on Mac Brown's TikTok and, and he boots. pulls out the cowboy boots? Yeah. <laughs> Every, yeah. Everything he does is kind of tough. To I watch. mean, it's, it's just brutal. like. Uh, what did they say? It's cringe. Go ahead, Vip. State yeah, I, th I think Jason hit on it perfect where Mac Brown understands the importance of this game. He's won the, the past two games, 89 to 31. <laughs> I do like Devin Leary as a quarterback. I think Devin Leary can at least make that game interesting where he was out the, the last last year's game against NC State. Will he be on the field for this one at the end of the year? Yeah, it's it's a lot of games where you're you're counting on him to be healthy by the end of the year. But I think that North Carolina, they from in comparison to years past, this team understands how big this game is for the in-state recruiting. And it's just two teams going on two uh, two completely different paths. And um, I'm going to make a bold statement here and say that this is the last game that we see uh, Dave on the sideline. That is a wow. bad one. Wow. Wow. No. I, I think it could be a prediction. This there. is the Larry I, Fedora fire game. I, I think it could be if you're looking at if the trend keeps continuing where North Carolina is just beating the brakes off NC State, no matter how many, you know, group of five games they win early on in the year, I think <laughs> I think that could be the one that kind of breaks uh breaks their back. Brutal. Imagine well, it, it what has Tom been, of, in fairness, that that has been the death nail of all previous NC State coaches, right? I mean, yep. uh, Mike O'Kane, Chuck Amata, Tom, Tom O'Brien, you know, Tom all those guys. Five and, and one against, against yeah, Carolina. And, then, and everything, gone, everything, you know? everything that a lot of the NC State beat writers had heard leading up to that Thanksgiving weekend game in 2016 against Carolina was that Doran was out the door. And then they get out to that, what, 21 zip lead and actually end up beating. Uh, North Carolina that saved his job, so that's so, another example. So, what do we think? Which, do we think Cut and Doran is out after this season? Cut has a lifetime deal, right? Yeah, he's he's not. Yeah. He's only no, he leave wouldn't be fired, but he would leave. Yeah, they'll he's never fire Cutcliffe. I mean, he'll stay as long as he wants to coach. Just but. have Peyton Manning come in for a visitation with the president. He'll be good. Yeah, so, maybe he'll so, sign Arch Manning to make him a. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Blue somebody Devil. said that on the what's you call it. If that happened, uh, was the 2016 game the best thing to happen for North Carolina football given what's happened the last two years? It sure hasn't hurt. Hadn't hurt. Uh, Greg Barnes, what? Where are we? Yeah, I'm gonna let Buck go last. So Greg Barnes, State Carolina. Yeah, if John Bunning is the shining example of how not to construct a schedule. Doran is the shining example of how to construct a schedule because I think he's had all these winning seasons, all these non-win seasons, and isn't he like 500 in ACC play? I think he's less like than 500. I think he's 28 like 28 and 38 or something like that. Yeah, yeah. he's um, not great. In he's ACC fooled a lot play. of people into thinking he's a good coach. Right, right. So credit to him uh, for doing that. Apparently, a, a Fayetteville Observer writer too. He <laughs> 28 and 38. Got that guy licking his boots, brought his boots out. 10 games under 500. So the people on YouTube can complain about my Virginia pick all you want. Um, Virginia is going to be a much tougher game than this one. I agree with that. Yeah. So I got, uh, I got Carolina winning this one pretty handily in Raleigh. 
Greg read the comment that if he chooses UNC to go eight and four, he's not allowed back on the show next year. I, I didn't, but that's funny. <laughs> that's funny. Well, he's but, already got them out of the coastal running, though, right? No, I've got no, Carolina no. winning the coastal. No, oh, they, 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 they it'll be hard. They, they got six and two. Losses. Losses. I've got them They're six not and two. Win you the know, coastal. Miami is going to tank a couple games. Same with Pitt. Pitt and Miami. Well, you, you the got coastal. Miami beating. Oh, you, you got North Carolina beating Miami. Didn't, okay. Didn't Pitt win the coastal at like five and three? Or are they six yeah, I mean, and two? Oh, it's been done. Yeah. yeah. So six and two is winning the coastal. But Carolina and State, what is that? That is Thanksgiving weekend, which I I despise that. But anyway. Friday game. Yeah. Um, this game really on paper um, should be a close game. Um, North Carolina uh, North Carolina State is like. Uh, the fourth toughest game that North Carolina plays, according to the FPI and the S and P plus, I mean, it's not like they don't have talent in Raleigh. They do. They have talent there. Uh, I think their running back group is good. If they keep Larry healthy, defense should be decent. I mean, they've got a chance to be the second best team in the, uh, Atlantic division. I would think, uh, who else Boston college might be second best there or yeah. somebody like that. Uh, and so this, this game should be, you know, like a you know, 33 to 25 game, something like that, but it won't be, uh, you know, North Carolina will win uh, approximately about, about the same scores they've won the last two. Um, and you know, it's going to be, uh, Sam Howell's, uh, last, ACC game uh, before he goes, leaves the program. Um, about the ACC championship. Yeah. And the ACC, and particularly with the ACC championship on the line, according to, you know, Greg Barnes, uh, they lose this game. They're all the way out of the, the running for the uh, get to the title game. So you know, I think they win this game. I think they win it probably by a couple of touchdowns. I think. NC State may want, may want to win this game too much. Um, I think they, they might hurt themselves by being as uh, as high for this game as they'll up, ultimately end up being. So, yeah. Mac uh, Brown is full size. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, North Carolina wins this game. I, I, I'm not uh, nervous about that, that finale at State. All right, Tommy, hold on. Let me get a drum roll going. Yeah, I, but uh, Tommy's not going to pick if he stayed against UNC. That's, that's not going to happen. You don't. You don't get happen. this far. No. You don't come this no. far to get this I, far. I uh, the, hold on, ready? I played the drum roll. So in three seconds, ready? One, two, three. Uh, North Carolina finishes the regular season twelve and zero. Wow, with a win wow. against Carolina. I do think they probably finish the. Season twelve and Tommy two. has no shame when it comes to pandering uh, hey, to the YouTube live. So good, so I, good. I have. <laughs> I am so I, torn right now on whether or not I should bump it down to nine and three. Staples is like the <laughs> Staples is like the kid at Christmas who gets oh everything he wants and thinks he didn't get me. Look, Carolina's going to lose a game or two, but I'm not picking them to lose a game or two. If I had to be perfectly honest, I think at Notre Dame and at Pitt are the troublesome ones for me. They're not going to lose at home. Uh, Kenan Stadium is going to be on fire. If they beat Virginia Tech handily, then they're going 12-0 this season. Um, not ready to predict the ACC championship. No, you, we have I think to. we should. We let's have let's to. take a shot. Let's take okay. a shot. All six of us have us in the ACC championship game, so we have to. Let's take I a lost. shot. If, if Tommy predicts a win, though, he has to predict the next game against Alabama. Yeah, <laughs> Tommy's twelve and two just went to fifteen and zero. Pain. All right, Greg Barnes, ACC championship game, Clemson. Uh, I think it's a competitive game, but I think UNC uh, is probably a year away. Buck, I'm just going down the list. Uh, I, I think they lose, but I, I'm not sure it's because. North Carolina is a year away. I mean, I think the 2022 team will be okay. Um, but 
you are going to be breaking in a quarterback that's not going to be Sam Howell and it's not going to be leading an offense in their third season. So, um, but I do think they, they probably lose this game because I think Clemson's probably just got a little too much depth um, defensively and offensively, and they have better receivers too, I think. Vip? I think if there is a year that you want to play Clemson, it would be this year, no Trevor Lawrence, no Travis Etienne, uh, replacing a lot of people on defense where it's just they have a lot of guys, but it, it's what they do every year. They just rebuild and reload um, so I would pick Clemson to win that game. Gregory. I'm just skipping over. Oh, he's putting his L up. Is that why? The it's drama a, is a, building on it, just it's a how loss far for, Tommy yeah. Ashley will go. Yeah. During it's, a, it's, a lo- it's a loss for me, although I agree with Taylor that if there's a year that, you know, you, you'd pick that upset in recent years, it's this year for a number of reasons. But look, let's yeah, be honest. I think Carolina's a year or two away. Let's Gregory be Gregory goes with the W. Carolina in 2015. Love back. Carolina in 2015. The ACC team does not make the college football playoff this year. If Carolina finishes the way I got them, they're going to the playoff. But I've got them 11 and 2. <laughs> and they're not, they're You're not, not keeping it. them out if they win this game. <laughs> you know, I just, uh, the dream ends in Charlotte on, uh, it kind of reminds me of the 2015 year, even though this team's much, much better in 2015. I think Carolina gets there. Um, but it's tough to pick against Sam Howell, though, right? Even though Sam Howell, Greg, what's Sam Howell's Obviously. career record? Obviously. Oh, he is 15 and 10. 15 and 10. So you we said he, that two weeks ago, and now you love that. He's the greatest thing ever, but he's only 15 and 10. So uh, I didn't put a W there I'm yet. sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I've got a loss. I've got a loss, but I've got them uh, in the New Year's Six Bowl, which I think would be what the Fiesta Bowl against uh, Cincinnati or somewhere like that. So I think Carolina can do the can do the twelve and one thing or the or the thirteen and one thing. But Mac Brown, when he walked on campus, he said twenty twenty one was the year, and you either believe or you don't. Uh, And I think I believe the man. So. 12-0 12 and 0 regular season, lose the Clemson in the Clemson ACC championship game, and then play whoever in the, yeah. in the Fiesta Bowl. Tommy, the um, one thing I think is important to talk about here is this ACC championship game, provided North Carolina gets there, is critically important for the chance to go back to New York Six Bowl game. And the reason why is is that the Orange Bowl is hosting a semifinal game, and so what that means is North Carolina got into the Orange Bowl last year because an ACC team was always going to the Orange Bowl. And so when Notre Dame and Clemson got into the playoff, the Orange Bowl took the next ACC team, which is Carolina. That's not the case this year. Uh, The ACC champion is guaranteed to get in. But if Clemson's able to get to the ACC championship game, like we think they will, it wins and gets to the college football playoff, there's no guarantee that the next best ACC team will get in. And so that really does. I mean, that, that puts you into a mix of, you have the third best SEC team, which could be Florida, it could be AM, Georgia, uh, with Notre Dame. So th- it's going to be much more difficult for North Carolina to get to your New Year's Six game this year. And the way to do that, uh, easiest, of course, is, is to win the ACC championship. It is, uh, you know, Josh Pate of Late Kick, Josh talks about all this kind of stuff, and he, he's really high on Carolina, but I, I think beating Clemson at this point is a tall task, even though I think Sam Howe can do it, like I said earlier. Uh, Buck Sanders, final thoughts on the yearly InsightCarolina.com prediction pod that we've done here on On The Beat Live, probably the longest live show we've ever done, way past my bedtime. We've had over 300 people the whole time, which is double what we had last week. So the return of G. Biggie and Buck Sanders has doubled our when El Jefe's in the house, people got to be there, man. Buck yeah. Sanders, final thoughts. I, I think it, it was a great show. I really enjoyed doing it. Uh, it's interesting to see how people uh, evolve during the uh, podcast, um, which is that should be you should look up evolve in the dictionary and see a picture <laughs> of Jason Staples. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but it's fun. Uh, it's all in fun predictions or <laughs> what they are. 
Uh, but it gives us a chance to kind of preview the season a little bit and uh, set the stage for what's to come. Indeed. Vip. It's been a pleasure. Always enjoy it. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, I'm the closest this year. I was, I was one off last year that wake forest game would have, would have sealed the win for me and kind of, uh, kind of set the tone for me heading into this year, but it's, it's always great when you have, uh, this group of guys. So did you just, uh, wish for a wake forest loss that would have helped you win <laughs> inside Carolina pick them contest? Is I that what that's I just what heard? I heard. <laughs> that's definitely what I heard. Uh, Jason. the pick them contest. It's, it's, it doesn't get any bigger than this. <laughs> <laughs> Jason Staples, final thoughts. Well, you know, the evolution is, uh, is an important <laughs> way to, uh, to, you know, improve as a person and as an analyst and all of this, you gotta be flexible, but, uh, <laughs> No, or wishy washy, you know, one of the yeah, other. or wishy washy, whatever. Um, I I think this is a this is going to be a really fun season, and you know there are some games on the margin that Carolina can lose, as we've talked about. There are, there are a number of losable games here, but this is going to be a good Carolina team, and I do have some concerns that some people might be going into the season with a bit too high of expectations and wind up disappointed on the season i you know nobody in in here of course would would qualify uh for that but i think if you go into this season really expecting say nine or ten wins and then you'll take anything above say nine wins as a success because that is a step forward again that's progress under mac brown that's the next step forward if they had ten if they hit ten wins on the in the regular season this year that's a success that means they are steadily marching forward on Mac Brown's plan. And I think that that's where I've got them. Uh, you know, we can all hope they, they exceed that, but I think that would be a success this season, given the schedule and, and other things. Indeed. Gregory Hall. I believe Josh Pate is going to be in Chapel Hill for the Miami game. If he stays true to what he said. So that could be fun. Um, and I believe he has UNC in his final four. If I recall, he has them oh. losing to Clemson in the ACC championship. Oh, game, so no, so he doesn't have it in the final four. Okay. But which is yeah. what I said. I just, it's going to be crazy. And six and two is going to win it. And it's going to, they're going to get to the ACC championship game and they're going to do what no one thinks that they can do. So, and by nobody, I mean all of you five people. So, yeah, it's going to be a, wild season i'm very much looking forward to not a single one of my losses being correct and two losses being somewhere else on the schedule so yeah that's all i have to say and thanks to everyone who tuned in 300 plus is is pretty cool for already week six before we even have a game to talk about yeah greg barnes you're always the the realist so be real what's up well just looking at what we picked here and everybody's going to give me grief about Virginia. Have at it. Uh, but but that is a game. <laughs> you deserve you know, it. Jay that Bateman, is, notwithstanding. I hope to hear from Jay. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, that That's a game that North Carolina clearly can win. But when you look at our picks, five of the six of us have North Carolina undefeated going into that Miami game, which is the middle of October. Uh, I just did a quick, rough look. Last 75 years. There have been four North Carolina teams that reached the middle of October undefeated. So regardless of how we picked all these games, everybody on this podcast uh, believes that this can be an incredibly special year for North Carolina. Uh, one, one of the best seasons that we've ever seen in our lifetimes. Um, and so I think everybody, I've said this before, but I want to say it again. Uh, enjoy, enjoy this ride. Really, These are rare seasons, especially for a team like North Carolina. Hopefully there's more to come, but really enjoy every game and losses will be hard. they will inevitably be a loss at some point, uh, but, but really try to embrace it and enjoy it as best you can, because this is a rarity. I mean, you know, three years ago, North Carolina had won five games in two years. And we, we are a long way away from that, even though years wise, it's really not that long. So uh, just, just understand that this is a special year ahead and really enjoy the ride because it's going to be a fun one. Indeed, Greg Barnes, with the words of wisdom there. I, you know, leading up to this season, Buck and I have talked about it, as with a lot of um, 
old time Carolina football fans, this is as good as it gets, folks. And I know we have a lot of fun with this prediction pod. Uh, Mac Brown's done wonders. I'll never forget after Carolina lost in Greenville uh, back in 2018, Buck Sanders and I started talking about why not Mac Brown come back to Chapel Hill to fix this. And everybody thought we were crazy. Um, so they started there and now we're here. 2021 with Carolina having the opportunity to have a special season. It opens Friday night, 6 p.m. in Virginia Tech. Uh, most of us will be there. Jason Staples and Joey Powell will be hosting the Inside Carolina Live pregame show from Old East Tavern in Chapel Hill. If you're around, go check them out. Um, if you're not around, you need to be in Blacksburg. I'll be circling around looking for a place to park. I'll probably bring some Blue Shark vodka, which also sponsors the postgame podcast with Ross Martin and Sean Drone. Check that out immediately after the ball game on Carolina's or InsideCarolina.com socials. YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and all that. For Gregory Hall, Greg Barnes, Buck Sanders, Jason Staples, and Taylor Ripples, I've been your host, Tommy Ashley. We've been sponsored by Johnny T-Shirt. It's been On The Beat Live. Thanks a bunch, folks.